Buenos eh, días a todos, bienvenidos, disculpen la tardanza en comenzar, como ustedes saben a mí me gusta mucho la puntualidad, pero tuvimos algunos problemas técnicos y queremos que eh, gocen al 100% esta presentación, entonces ya los hemos logrado resolver. Eh, eh, voy a presentar a las personas que tenemos con nosotros en, el, en pues no es presidium, en la mesa el día de hoy, en primer lugar tenemos al rector general de nuestra universidad, el doctor Abel Peñalosa. Un aplauso, por favor. Y al director de la División de Ciencias de la Comunicación y Diseño, el maestro Octavio Mercado. Un aplauso. Y antes de eh, pasarle la palabra a nuestro director, eh, quisiera simplemente agradecer eh, su presencia aquí, en particular a nuestro rector general, porque la verdad es que la agenda de un rector general pues es tremenda, eh, tiene 50 mil ocupaciones, pero señor rector, para nosotros es muy importante sentirlo cerca. Entonces, le, le agradecemos mucho que esté aquí con nosotros, con los estudiantes, con los profesores, que se haya dado eh, el tiempo de, de poder venir y, y estar un rato con nosotros, convivir, porque sí creo que es, es una parte muy importante, se lo agradezco mucho. Entonces, primero le paso la a, palabra a nuestro director, al maestro Octavio. Gracias. Bueno, muy brevemente, este, para la visión de Ciencias de la Comunicación y Diseño es muy importante este tipo de eventos, por eh, distintas razones. Primero, porque es algo que ha logrado hacerse de manera reiterada. Es muy común que eh, haya esfuerzos ocasionales por parte de los profesores en la organización de coloquios, eventos y discusiones que eh, rara vez llegan a fructificar y a, a prolongarse en el tiempo y a generar una continuidad eh, como la que ha, ha conseguido el coloquio en creatividad computacional, llegando al número 12. Me parece que eso es algo muy meritorio por parte de, eh, de Rafael en particular como organizador y justamente lo que permite es darle continuidad a discusiones y seguir avanzando en temas. Por un lado me parece que es algo que reitero quisiera eh, recalcar. Lo otro tiene que ver con el tema mismo de, las, eh, de, este, eh, de esta clase de discusiones, en términos de la manera en la que nos permite asociar preocupaciones que son comunes a distintas áreas al interior de la división, en relación a la manera en la que las nuevas tecnologías generan modificaciones, no solamente en este, cuestiones relacionadas con la, eh, con la producción, sino con la generación de cultura y de qué manera ciertas actividades que consideramos a veces eh, creativas y esencialmente eh, vinculadas con lo humano quedan alteradas o bien quedan cuestionadas a partir de la irrupción de las nuevas tecnologías como eh, herramientas no solamente eh, para la producción, sino como eh, espacios desde donde se generan eh, nuevos contenidos. Entonces, en ese sentido hay como un, un conjunto y una, reitero, tradición de discusiones en los últimos años respecto a ese tipo de temas que me parece que han enriquecido mucho el, eh, el trabajo al interior tanto de las aulas como las investigaciones de los profesores en licenciatura y en posgrado y en ese sentido me parece que este es un, eh, un evento claramente exitoso a lo largo del tiempo. Así que, bueno, muchas felicidades. Ahora cedemos la palabra a nuestro rector general, el doctor Peñalosa. Muchas gracias. Bueno, yo estoy muy complacido de estar aquí de regreso además en la unidad Cojimalpa, eh, do donde me encanta venir, además ver gente nueva, eh, nuevos alumnos, tanto de licenciatura como posgrado, me da mucho gusto estar aquí. Efectivamente coincido con lo que dice Octavio en el sentido de que este es un yo pienso que este puede ser el evento más longevo de la unidad, eh, tiene 12 ediciones en 12 años, o sea, yo creo que Rafael desde el primer año andaba ahí tratando de 
organizar este evento, a lo cual eh, pues me, me complace mucho y me, me lo felicito mucho porque me parece que este es un evento que ha tenido mucho eh, de diferentes ponentes y quiero destacar dos cosas que, me, que lo hacen especial, uno es que es interdisciplinario, si bien aquí hay gente, mucha gente de computación, pero también veo gente de comunicación, eh, también gente de diseño, entonces creo que es un, es un evento interdisciplinario, la vocación interdisciplinaria de, de este coloquio es fundamental y es de destacarse, así como la postura de, del organizador, el doctor Rafael Pérez Pérez, quien es eh, esencialmente un, un eh, devoto practicante de la interdisciplina y la promueve además. Entonces es interdisciplinario, es internacional, esto también me parece muy importante y muy destacado, siempre hemos tenido presencia de eh, conferencistas y de talleristas que son eh, internacionales y este es un, un elemento que le da también una, un, una connotación de enriquecimiento por esta razón. Hay una cosa que le falta hacer y que yo creo que lo podemos lograr ahora, que es que sea interunidades también, ¿no? Esto, interunidades, interinstituciones, eh, yo creo que esto tiene que crecer en estos ya 12 años que tenemos de trabajo, digo tenemos porque pues yo me siento parte también de este, de este grupo, y creo que podemos lograr esto otro, y lo estaremos eh, pues promoviendo. Veo un auditorio, que este auditorio lo conozco bien, casi lleno, eh, con mucha gente de… De, de todos los sectores que, que, que he mencionado. ¿no? Entonces me parece que es un, un evento muy importante, tenemos la presencia de la doctora Maya Ackerman, que está aquí a mi extrema derecha y ella va a ser la conferencista ahora, que terminemos de decir lo que estamos diciendo y eh, ella va a hablar de, el, de uno de los temas fundamentales que tiene que ver con la música y las computadoras. ¿no? La creatividad es el tema central de esto siempre, que es un tema además muy guamita, muy cuajimalpense, pero muy guamita, eh, y yo creo que tenemos que escuchar con mucha eh, atención lo que nos va a decir la conferencista, y mañana tendremos un taller, que este taller, yo no sé si estoy robando lo que iba a decir Rafael, pero, pero bueno, el otro taller, lo de mañana, es, es también tradicional en este evento, y es importante porque habla de la computadora como un socio creativo, la computadora como un socio creativo, es fundamental esto, esta digamos diada, ¿no? la computadora que es a veces tonta, a veces no tanto, pero que con nuestra ayuda este, podemos hacer que sea un poco más inteligente y por supuesto creativa. Pues no me queda mucho más que, que de, decirles, expresarles, comunicarles, que estoy complacido por todas estas razones y estaremos trabajando con, con este grupo y así como con otros en la unidad, vamos a estar viniendo a la unidad, no he dejado de venir a la unidad, aunque algunos me dicen que no es cierto, pero tres veces ya he venido, este, yo creo que tres veces en dos meses más o menos, no está mal, pero vamos a seguir viniendo, vamos a hablar con alumnos, con jefes de departamento, con directores, para ver qué es lo que, lo que escuchamos de ustedes y con un gran este, interés haremos todo para, para ir adelante con la UAM. Muchas gracias. Eh, pues finalmente, antes de pedirle a nuestro rector que formalmente inaugure nuestro coloquio, yo simplemente quiero dar las gracias eh, a las personas que nos han apoyado a hacer el coloquio, al director de nuestra división, eh, al doctor, eh, al maestro Octavio Mercado, muchas gracias, a la coordinadora de la MADIC, que también ha sido muy importante en su ayuda, Rocío, muchas gracias, y al jefe de nuestro departamento de tecnologías de la información, que también nos ha apoyado en forma muy importante para poder llevar a, a cabo este coloquio, eh, no fue fácil eh, arreglar todo lo que se tuvo que arreglar, así es que les agradezco mucho a los tres, eh, a los profesores que han venido y que han eh, mandado a sus alumnos y también simplemente quiero decir que como otra actividad que tenemos 
es la, eh, los alumnos de la MADIC van a presentar a nuestra invitada sus proyectos y ellos van a recibir una retroalimentación de ella. Entonces, pues creo que es un evento bast bastante complejo, completo en ese sentido. En, eh, y por supuesto, muchas gracias a nuestra invitada por, por estar aquí. Estoy muy contento de que hayas aceptado venir a compartir con nosotros todos tus conocimientos. Y pues si of oficialmente nos puede... Claro, les pediría si nos ponemos de pie para que darle formalidad al acto. Y bueno, pues siendo las 11 horas con 24 minutos de hoy, eh, 17 de octubre de 2017, pues damos por iniciados los trabajos de este decimosegundo coloquio de creatividad computacional. Que sea excelente, les deseo lo mejor y con esto damos por iniciados los trabajos de este coloquio. Gracias, muchas gracias. Bueno, um, well, um, we are going to start. Uh, this is Professor Maya Ackerman, and I will give her the microphone in order she uh, starts her talk and present herself. Thank you so much for coming, Maya. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Rafael, for inviting me. It's been uh, already a wonderful visit. Uh, it's my first time visiting Mexico, and I'm I'm so impressed with how beautiful the country is and how delicious the food is. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I should probably mention before I start, uh, if at any point you have questions, you don't have to wait until the end, just raise your hand. And uh, if uh, you want to ask in Spanish, the translator has kindly agreed to help translate uh, what you're saying so that I can clarify anything and uh, answer questions that they come up. Uh, a little bit about myself, I uh, studied in Canada did all my degrees in the University of Waterloo. Uh, studied there for 12 years. Um, then I did postdocs at uh, Caltech first, and then UC San Diego. And right now, I'm a professor at Santa Clara University in their computer engineering department. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, really great. it's really great to be here and tell you about uh, my favorite project, uh, connecting music with artificial intelligence. Okay, how it all began. Now I get to talk about myself some more. Um, so I studied computer science in Waterloo, like I just mentioned. And um, towards the end of my PhD, my husband actually decided that he wants to learn how to sing. He was going through uh, kind of his own um, artistic exploration. And I thought, what is happening? I should be the one who is learning how to sing. And so and that's really happened. I, I went to um, his teacher, and I started taking lessons, and I really, really fell in love with singing in the middle of my PhD in studying computer science. <laughs> and it sort of, I kind of developed these two parallel lives. On one hand, I was studying computer science, doing research at that time in theoretical machine learning, and, and I was starting to become a better and better singer and started singing semi-professionally as well. Um, And then I decided that I really want to make my own music. It sort of hit me. I remember, I remember, you know those moments in your life that you remember very, very clearly? So I had one of these moments in the bus, and I'm thinking, okay, if I could do anything, what would I want to do? And at that moment, I thought, I really want to have my own songs. I want to be able to write my own music. And so in addition to, you know, just continuing my computer science studies and becoming a postdoc and later a computer science professor, I, was, I learned how to produce music. I started writing lyrics. I kept learning how to sing better and better. But I couldn't write melodies. I couldn't. It's not because I didn't try. I even took improvisation lessons. I tried. I really tried to learn, but it just wasn't coming. It wasn't. It was very, very frustrating. Um, and then, uh, then something happened. Um, I guess this, this, we're going to have to skip this, this slide now. Um, so it was uh, this really, really amazing sequence of events 
that led me to the International Conference on Computational Creativity, uh, the community that actually uh, Rafael is heading. And it was during the very first talk of that conference that somebody mentioned the idea in passing. They mentioned the idea as if it's obvious that the computer can be a collaborator, that it doesn't have to be a tool, that it can be a collaborator perhaps in a similar way that another human can be a collaborator. And at that moment, I thought, okay, perfect. I will make myself a computer collaborator that can help me write songs. And so my whole research direction has changed very radically since that moment. So uh, I ended up calling the system that we created, which, with which I write songs now, and which a few other of my colleagues also started using to create music. I call it Alicia because I like giving all my projects girls' names. And uh, I like to say that I do that to increase the number of women in computer science. To be honest, I'm not sure what that means, but people like it, so that's good. <laughs> um, so, okay, this, this project is in collaboration with David Locker and Christopher Cassian. That's my student. And it attracted a lot of media attention. I, um, I published a draft uh, on ArcGIS, which is not even really a publication. This is very early on. Um, so before the paper even got, but got properly published in a real peer-reviewed venue, Already, uh, I had uh, it was a new scientist first who contacted me who wanted to learn more about it, and then it kind of this cascade of media attention on this project, which was really a very uh, wonderful surprise for me. I wasn't wasn't expecting that. See, when you do research on theoretical machine learning, the media for some reason is not as interested. I don't know why. Uh, so Alicia is data driven, means that um, it learns directly from the data. So we give it a whole bunch of, uh, currently we have um, thousands of songs that it learns from. And so it tries to figure out how to compose melodies based on the human melodies that it sees. Um, so the idea is, um, as a human, we tell the machine what it should be looking for, but we don't tell the machine exactly what to do. So we told Alicia that, it should perhaps pay attention to the time signature and key signature to figure out how to create nice melodies for text. And maybe it should also look at certain things about the text. So for example, Alicia pays attention to the vowels in the syllables that, it, uh, that it's trying to create music for. It pays attention to how common are the words for which it's creating melodies. So lots and lots of these features. And then with all of these features, uh, we train a model, originally, for those of you who might know a little bit of machine learning, originally it was a random forest model, right now we apply deep learning models. Um, and the machine builds a model by itself, we don't, we don't direct it very closely. Well, we couldn't, think about it, I don't know how to write melodies. So I couldn't tell a computer exactly what to do. So it's, it, it almost has to use an indirect approach. Any questions so far? No questions, okay. Um, so uh, one of the first people other than me who used the system, his name is Joshua Palke, he's a professor at CSU Long Beach. Um, and here's a picture of him using it. Now the way it works is, and those of you who are coming to the workshop will get a chance to use it because finally this weekend we put it up online. Lots of work, but very, very exciting for me to, to make it easily accessible to everybody else. The way it works is you type text, unfortunately just in English right now, but eventually we will add other languages. And it gives you different options for melodies to which you could sing that text. So for example, you tell it, today is a beautiful day, and it gives you different options, like today is a beautiful day, or today is a beautiful day, you know. Lots of, lots of possibilities like that. And you pick the one that you like. So you are participating. You're not just sitting there pressing one button. You get to listen to different options, select which one you like, and then type the next sentence and select a melody for it. So it's a real interaction between the human and the computer. Uh, we also added some co-creating functionality. So uh, to, make it, to make this collaboration more rich. So you know how when you're working with a human, there's many different ways that you could communicate, right? Now, of course, the communication with Alicia is more limited. You can't express as many ideas as you can using natural language. 
Uh, but we added some, some things that you can say. You can, you can tell Alicia, I like the pitches, the notes that you selected, but I don't really like the length of the notes. So the note durations are not so good. And so it's going to give you more options that have the same pitches, the same height of the notes, uh, but different options for note durations. Now that's very important when you're setting text, right? Maybe if you're creating melody without words, maybe you wouldn't need to, be, to, to give that command. But with this, because you're setting language to emphasize which words are important, to make the stress correct, sometimes you need alternate uh, durations for your melodies. Uh, yeah, and you can also uh, say, I like this melody, but I, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's not perfect. Give me some similar stuff. So that's another co-creative feature that we added. And that, that's very helpful. Uh, the composers who used our system said that that's, that's been very helpful to help them come up with uh, a good collaborative piece. Um, originally, I imagined it primarily being used by electronic musicians. But I was very surprised that classical musicians actually got very excited about it as well. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of interesting how, how diverse this collaboration with Alicia can be. So I was going to show you some stuff, some songs that we made with Alicia. Keep in mind that Alicia doesn't do everything. Um, it does the melody. It comes up with the basic melody line um, based on the lyrics that you provide. Then later we need collaboration, more collaboration with humans to actually produce the music for a human to sing it. Okay. So uh, here is this is actually the very first song that I ever made with Alicia. And you know how sometimes I know there are some artists in the room. How sometimes you create a piece of art and then you don't like it, and you have to come back to it a few years later and say, actually, that was pretty good. So that's what's happening to me with this song. <laughs> I, I like it again now. Uh, so I'm going to have to turn on the song from my computer so that you can hear it. I'll read the lyrics afterwards. Okay, I apologize, I didn't, uh, for, I promised to first read the lyrics, so don't let me forget next time. Um, okay, so the lyrics are saying, these are lyrics that I made up and fed into Alicia. It says, now that you're gone, I just realized I'm all alone. Forgive me if I throw away the phone. Stop wondering where we went wrong. Tell me, after all you've done, why do I still miss you? Why do I still miss you? So that was my attempt at a pop song. Very, very first attempt. I think it's pretty good for a first attempt. <laughs> now keep in mind that I could not compose music before this at all. Okay, at all. And then suddenly I could do something that's, you know, a pop song. So I was very happy. Uh, then uh, this, this next song, I'm actually going to perform for you. I'm going to sing you a song. I, t I told you I'm a singer, I have, to, I have to prove. I wasn't just making stuff up, right? Um, so this song was made by Joshua Palke, whose picture I showed earlier. So he used Alicia to create, uh, to create the melody, and then he came up with the chords underneath. Uh, he actually primarily focuses on conducting choirs, so he really enjoys harmonizing. And he said that even classical musicians, for them it's often very hard to come up with this melody line. Uh, and so for him, it was nice to have a machine help with that so that he can focus on what he likes. And that's actually something that I think is uh, one of the most beautiful things about uh, collaboration with a computer, to free up your time to focus on 
first of all, what you can do, but secondly, stuff that you enjoy the most. OK, um, and that, that kind of helped me understand the utility of this type of co-creative system in the classical music domain. OK, so um, Josh Palki arranged it. He used Alicia to create the melodies. I'm going to sing it for you. It was produced by my brother, uh, Ronan Ackerman, who DJs quite a bit. Uh, and the lyrics are by Emily Dickinson, who's a really famous, uh, very famous poet. Okay, it's a very beautiful poem here. Um, actually, a lot, of, a lot of musicians have been setting um, uh, Emily Dickinson's music, uh, words to music for a very long time. So it was interesting to have a machine do something that humans have been doing for so long. Okay, so I'm just gonna read it. Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetness in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Okay, so I promised to sing it for you, right? Should I sing? Without the mic going to be okay, you think? I will do my best. <laughs> Usually you have to practice with the mic you're going to sing with, but I'll be good. It's uh, always fun to sing in a setting where people don't usually sing. <laughs> it makes it extra special. <laughs> 
Okay, um, another variation um, on Alicia that we explored has to do with, uh, with other languages. So I mentioned earlier that we could extend Alicia to other languages, and the one other language that we tried is Italian, because some of the most beautiful opera is in Italian, and I don't know if I mentioned it, but my uh, vocal specialization is opera. So um, we're doing a really amazing project with this Italian variation of Alicia. So uh, we took the music of Giacomo Puccini. You guys heard of him? Puccini, of course. Some of the most beautiful operas in the world. So um, we trained uh, Alicia on, uh, on his music, and so we renamed that branch of Alicia to Robocini. That seemed appropriate. Um, OK, next, next slide. So um, my, uh, my colleague, James Morgan, from San Jose State University, is the one who is using the system to create an entire opera. Now the opera is set, and I'm not making this up, in World of Warcraft. Okay, it's like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> um, and the main character is a torrent, this big cow woman, very powerful. I get to sing as, as, her, as this cow woman character, it's fantastic. Uh, actually, at uh, the last ICCC there was a concert where I performed one of the pieces, and so I got myself horns. So it's more believable, right? Okay, so now uh, this torrent is very, um, you know, like in World of Warcraft, you go on raids, you know, and fight. So, of course, that's what she does too, and it's a very important character. So there's a lot of pressure on her to go out on these raids, right? But... She has a little baby torrent at home and a husband. And so she's torn between her family life and being an adventurer. Right? So that's what this, this aria is, is starting to hint at. The troubles of a World of Warcraft character. Uh, so the melody, of course, is by Robocini. The lyrics uh, were made up by James Morgans and translated to, then to Italian. Um, the arrangement, uh, yeah, so the person who used uh, Robocini is also James Morgan. My student, uh, Nick uh, Macias, uh, produced the music. He's a really excellent musician. He did all the work on the computer to actually sonify the score. Uh, then the machinimist of the video that I'm going to show you uh, is Chantal Ger Gerard. And uh, I'm, th I'm the voice in the video. Uh, so if you could please turn on the video for us. That'd be great. Is the music going to come out of? Uh, we'll see. OK. We shall find out. Oh, hold on. We needed, we needed what it's talking about as well. well it's in Italian. I'll, I'll read it for you afterwards. Basically, she's talking about how uh, the prairies are so beautiful. Uh, and then she's talking about, uh, it kind of starts mentioning her family a little bit to hint at her troubles.
Yeah, so we are, uh, we're working on the second aria in the opera right now. We're going to try to do it in English and see if it works in English. Uh, it's not clear. <laughs> and then we'll decide uh, in what language to do the entire opera. Uh, so yeah, okay, again in reverse, in reverse order, sorry about that. Uh, here are the, the lyrics. Um, Lash oases that hide the wailing taverns, vast open spaces of oranges and gold, the grasses of the prairie, the wandering lizards. I've made a home and made a family in the south in an outpost with a small community that sees such traffic in the passing adventurers. So this last line is what's starting to hint at a little bit of the issues that she's working through. All right, so this is... Okay, any questions so far? There's a question. Uh, should I put on, maybe, uh, maybe before we start, I'll, I'll put this on just for quick. Yes, please. Ah, bueno. Me, me estoy haciendo bolas eh, sobre la canción que y todo la sí, ah, gracias. Sobre todo lo que lo que estamos viendo, hay hay, lir, hay li, lírica, well, lyrics, uh, eh, melodía, arreglos eh, y hay gente involucrada. Entonces, eh, antes de que sigas, me gustaría volver a detenernos para que nos dijeras eh, en qué manera la computadora está interviniendo en las cosas que hemos escuchado. Sí. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a very very important uh, to to get that clear and I think I think because these type of collaborations between a uh, computer and and people is so unusual, it's very easy to slip and believe that the computer does everything or does more than it really does. So it's very, very important to get that very clear. So what happens is um, the person types one sentence of lyrics that they got from somewhere else. Then the computer gives, I could even demonstrate on the computer just by logging into my account, and the computer gives a melody, but just the vocal line, like the top, if you think of a music score, just the very top line of a music score that basically tells the singer what to sing and everything else. So for example, then the human selects which of these melodies they like. So the computer gives different options and the human selects which one they like. And then for the next sentence, the user again types one sentence of lyrics and the computer again proposes options for how the singer might sing it. And again, that gets selected. I could actually be happy to show you on the computer screen. And then that creates the whole melody line. Then we need somebody else or the same human to produce the music, to, to convert the musical score into actual sound and a human to sing it. So the computer role is the one, the one piece. That, that makes sense? Yeah, let me, do you guys want me to show you? I think that we, we are good, good on time. We have only, have only one more section. Um, maybe I can, I can just demonstrate to you guys. Oh, oh, uh, the problem is demonstrating because I don't actually have access to. Tomorrow, tomorrow in the workshop, we, uh, people are actually gonna use it directly, but of, of course I would also demonstrate exactly how to use it. Um, yeah, it's, because it's such a new form of collaboration, it's, it's really not obvious what that means and who does what. But yeah, but I think it's, it suffices for now to understand all the, all the computer does is comes up with the melody line, with the kind of the score part of the melody line. Um, which is very, very hard to do for some humans like me. And, and even, even professional musicians sometimes struggle with that part. Um, of course, the vision is for the computer to do more, ultimately, so that the computer could help you with all the parts that you might find challenging, or help you with all the parts that you don't enjoy as much. So there's a kind of a bigger vision as well. There was another question, I think, right? You know, there is, yeah. eh, era muy similar, nada más preguntar como que eh, si oh, el oh, oh, sorry, sorry, just, just one second, I, I was yeah. not prepared. <laughs> I have a nerd point. 
Era muy similar, solo preguntar como el input que recibía la, uh -huh. en este caso el sistema, que es solo texto, eh, si eso era correcto. Y, y bueno, el output que se genera es como un archivo de audio o es como un, un archivo MIDI o es este que después sea interpretado por algo para convertirse en audio o como qué es el formato que, se, que es el de salida. Oh, very, very, very good question. So, so we're essentially creating um, a score. You know, guys know a musical score. That's what it's creating. So the way it gets displayed on the monitor is as a, the notes, the notes that the singer would sing. But then you can download it as a MIDI, and then it's easier. Th then it becomes more of a sort of software engineering challenge to convert it into a useful format. Um, yeah. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so. Were there any other questions so far? Okay, well, more questions later. I really, if there was a board, I could draw some stuff for you to better help explain. But um, maybe if you come to the workshop, it will be crystal clear. Um, all right, so this next part, this, this final part of today's presentation, uh, is my collaboration uh, with uh, Rafael Perez de Perez. Uh, extremely exciting collaboration because we are now giving the computer more power. So now the lyrics are computer generated. But not just computer generated. The lyrics tell a coherent story, which is an enormous challenge in artificial intelligence. Computers are good at, relatively good at creating short fragments, but to create something long that's coherent and makes sense and especially tells a story is notoriously difficult. Uh, so uh, to this end, uh, we've used very heavily the system uh, that Rafael has been, uh, has been working on for a long time uh, called Mexica. And uh, maybe he already told you much better, <laughs> but basically it tells narratives about uh, the Mexicas. Tells stories that you know, may have happened to them, stories in the flavor of their stories. And the stories are very coherent and very interesting, uh, which is amazing for a computer to be able to do this. So here is an example of the beginning of a story created by Mashika. Okay? So it says, the priest was born under grace of the great god. The lady was an inhabitant of the great city. The lady wanted him from the start. The lady hid her love from the priest. I told you, the stories are interesting. But she fell in love with him. The princess was in love with the priest. The princess admired the lady. And it goes on, we have this complicated love triangle, right? So the stories are designed to have these twists and turns and things that make stories exciting for humans. And so our idea was, why don't we start with Mashika's stories and convert them to lyrics? Now, what makes, what's the difference between a narrative and lyrics? There's many important differences. So lyrics often have some rhyme. They often use some language that's poetic, you know, more, more flowery language, less, less concrete. Uh, so we wanted to somehow keep all the essence, keep the whole story, but somehow tell it in a way that somebody could sing it, right? So uh, what we ended up doing uh, which uh, my student proposed this, this kind of variation, and I was really surprised how well it worked, is that we actually kept everything that Mashika gave us. We didn't change it, we didn't remove anything, but we added new lines. So all the new lines in red were added by our system, which we call Mabel. And so we had to work very hard to make it so that these lines are poetic, fit well with Mashika's lines, and also rhyme. So there's a lot of work that went into creating these, the red lines here. Uh, so here is kind of an example of the type of uh, lyrics that come out of this process. The priest was born under grace of the great God, and evolving from the shadow, lifted. The lady was an inhabitant of the great city, but just remember there's a sign of intensity. So you see sort of the story is now getting rounded out with some fancy language that, that hopefully makes it, makes it more poetic and more suitable for lyrics. 
the lady wanted him from the start, the friends that they are. The computer is, is finding these extensions. The lady hid her love from the priest. They just think they've got a secret. So part of the magic of this is that the human who reads it, the computer is, is, is working hard to make it fit, but the human who is reading it is also helping a little bit, right? So there's this phenomenon um, where humans try to make sense of what they're seeing. So for example, they have a secret. So it's like, well, that kind of fits, right? There's a love triangle, there's a secret, that makes sense. Um, but she fell in love with him, they don't know the time. The princess was in love with the priest, wondering where would they have got. The princess admired the lady, movies only make them crazy. So you know, it's different, <laughs> different types of lines that you get. Um, okay. <laughs> And so what we did, we actually took the later part of this song, uh, of the, these lyrics, and we fed them into Alicia. Remember? Alicia can take lyrics and create melodies. And this is what Alicia gives. So this is output. This is, if you type this sentence, this is what Alicia gave in this case. Okay, so now you might have a better idea of the output of Alicia as well. And uh, Rafael and I practiced, and we are going to perform this song for you. But not before, not before I read you the lyrics first. I am learning. Okay, so these are the lyrics. And again, um, first line, each, we alternate lines. One line, Mabel, uh, and one line, Mashika, in reverse order. So Mashika, Mabel, Mashika, Mabel. They took turns, and that had created these lyrics. But she fell in love with him. Girl, when they feel the same. The princess was in love with the priest. Can't let go, and it never goes out. She also abominated what he did, be the things they said. The princess was shocked by the priest's actions, and though her heart can't take it, it all happens. Very poetic. The first lyric generated, a generator of its kind who is telling coherent stories, which is uh, an achievement that I'm very proud of. Uh, very proud of my work with Raphael. So, so please come up. <laughs> the beautiful guitar. While you set up, can I can I have the external drive again? Oh, I'm sorry. Meanwhile, I'll arrange to be able to show you how Alicia looks. I put another thing in here called Alicia Deck, and I need to go to flight eight, just to show them how, how the system works. Um, give me a second. Ha! 
happening? This is our finale song. But she fell in love with him, girl, when they feel the same. The princess was in love with the priest, can't let go and it never goes out. She also abominated what he did, be the things they said. The princess was shocked by the priest's actions, and though her heart can't take, it all happens. Was she fell in love with him, girl, when they feel the same. The princess was in love with the priest. Can't let go and it never goes out. She also abominated what he did. Be the things they said. The princess was shocked by the priest's actions. And though her heart can't take, it all happens. This was really fun. <laughs> I like singing as Raphael. All right, so uh, if you want to try Alicia, you are welcome to come to the workshop happening tomorrow at yeah, 10 o'clock in the morning. So uh, you'll, I created accounts for a whole bunch of people so you could actually try it and make your own music. You can also email me if you have any questions or if you want to try Alicia. That's my email. I'm happy to have people play with it. Or you can just go here directly and sign up, but it's better to email me. Well, also sign up. Sure, why not? Um, and that's my uh, website where there are more examples of things that we created with Alicia. Could you please um, load the other? So I've, I've managed to find uh, another presentation that has pictures of what Alicia looks like when you use it to give you a little bit of a deeper understanding now that it has a user interface. At first, we use it from, from command line. <laughs> so we're going to need to go to slide, about slide eight, I'll just quickly. Uh, OK, is that? OK, so here's how it works, OK? Um, you type the lyrics in here. You then press generate. And Alicia gives you something that's going to look like this. It's the lyrics that you typed, but with notes, okay, so that you could sing them. Now you can listen. There is actually a button in Alicia to listen to what this sounds like, so you don't have to be able to read this music in your head. And then you can press next if you want a different options and keep pressing next. And then you can go previous. And then you can select it if you like it. And that's how you build your song. So here is after you selected a whole bunch of melodies. You could then say you want to select a new one, type the text, select an option that you like that Alicia gives you. And that's, that's how the collaboration looks. Yeah? And so you'll get, you'll get to make a song tomorrow if you come to the workshop. I'm so excited uh, to hear the songs that you make. OK, so now is a perfect time for questions, right? Oh, something else. Oh, lots of questions. OK, let me make sure that I am Gonna speak Spanish for the moment? Hi, hi. 
My name is Santiago. I'm a lecturer here at the university. My question is, I assume that your system creates a music that is, um, it has some certain notion of correctness. So it, it, it attaches the music to the lyrics in a following the rules, classical rules for that, yes? No. No, okay, so. But it, it does have a notion of correctness. Okay, so it's not just any music. No. Okay, it, it has to have some rules that will fit the um, music. It's, uh, it learns the, the rules from the music you give it, yes. Okay, so my question is, how good is the music? Is it, is it, um, you, I assume you get many, you can get many songs. Yeah. So how good is it? Is one, can you tell which one is better? Yeah, yeah, we can. Uh, in, in what sense? Um, so we have, that's an excellent question, by the way. Very important topic in computational creativity is this idea of evaluation. Um, so a system, it's relatively easy for computers to generate stuff. It's not so, I hope you don't mind the, the full answer. Um, it's, but it's, it's harder for them to figure out what to pick. So you know, oh, sorry. Um, Our flag. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there are sacred in Mexico. You know. I am going to stand here. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I like to walk everywhere. So, um, so if you think of a real artist, they're not just going to create a whole bunch of stuff and be like, okay, figure out what to put in the gallery. <laughs> figure somebody else, figure out what to you know, put on the CD. They have to do the evaluation themselves. To be an artist, you have to be able to evaluate. Now at this point, Alicia doesn't create the entire song, but it does create these, these melody fragments, right? These, these short melodies. So it has to be able to, to be a real computational creativity system. It needs to have some measure of evaluating how good that melody fragment is. And the way that we do it is a combination of two things. One is called likelihood. So basically, how likely was the system to generate it? And the way I like to explain it is, let's say you're having a fight with your girlfriend, boyfriend, or husband, or wife, and you might say some stuff that you actually were not very likely to say. Alicia also sometimes creates melodies that it wasn't likely to generate. And so we calculate the likelihood of the melody, and that's one thing. So one part of quality is how well is a melody even fitting Alicia's model of how to create music. That's one part. The other part uh, is entropy. So originally we trained Alicia on pop songs, which are extremely repetitive. They basically have music that has the same notes over and over again with the same duration. And in a co-creative system, that's useless because everybody can compose music like that. Uh, <laughs> before I, I get into more trouble. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a balance now. So it has those two factors. It is a mathematical formula that, that balances the likelihood of a, of a melody with its entropy. And that's considered the quality. Now, it's not good enough to make up your quality measure and say, yay, I know the quality measure. Uh, we did user studies where we looked at how humans ranked melodies gave them a few options, and they said, okay, this one is best, this one second best, this one next. And what Alicia does matches pretty well with how humans would rank melodies. So evaluation is this huge, massive thing. Very, very important. Thanks for bringing it up. Can I have another one? Yeah, of course. Uh, the second one is what you just sang, it sounded to me like a musical. Yes? Is this yeah. a coincidence? It, it sounds musical. Uh, which the part? The, the style, what you sang, from the music you sang. From Is it, yeah. Sounds like a musical. Oh, it sounds like a musical. Oh, I is see. Is it an accident or um, is this deliberate? I think, I think that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love it. So, um, I think the style that you end up with is a combination of Alicia and the choices made by the human. Me being an opera singer and really liking musicals, I think I end up choosing melodies that have a little bit of that flavor to it. Um, whereas when other people use it, it's they kind of they make different choices. They combine melodies differently. You get a different flavor. To be honest, it really surprised me that the melody is not very married to the style as much as I thought it would be. There is a relationship, but it's not perfect. You can The way you arrange them, the way that you sing them, the chords you put underneath also influence it a lot. Yeah. Thank you for the great question.
Aquí, yo tengo tres preguntas y serán breves. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sí. Mi pregunta es la siguiente. Bueno, yo fui reportero de espectáculos durante más de 20 años en Excelsior y tuve la oportunidad de convivir con grandes compositores como Consuelo Velázquez, Álvaro este, Manzanero, Roberto Cantoral, este, Martín Urieta, Tomás y Federico Méndez, entre otros. Y el dominador, denominador que podría decir, después de convivir y tener algunas bohemias con ellos, decían que para poder crear una canción se requiere mucho el vivir. Mi pregunta es, ¿su sistema no crea un sistema artificial de composición? ¿No se, no se escucharía artificial componer? Esa es una pregunta. La segunda, ¿considera usted que este sistema, tomando en cuenta la modernidad, ¿Es la nueva forma de los jóvenes de componer canciones? ¿Qué sucede con los derechos de autor? ¿Y cómo definiría usted su sistema? Muchas gracias. Ok, I'm going to do my best to answer. Uh, please, uh, if, if something, if I forget to answer some part, please just remind me so I can answer everything. Um, so, There was a copyright question and there was the question of life experience. Those are the two I'm going to address right now. Um, so there is something, um, uh, what's the right words? There is something very complicated and emotional about taking something that used to be purely human and then having the computer in any way start taking a piece of it. And I really understand The, the, the feelings and the, the conflict that arises from this. Um, so I, I do have a lot of respect for these type of perspectives. Um, music is very complicated and very, very human, in large part because nobody competes with us for creating music, at least in the same way that we create music. Um, so I don't think that at this point or any time very soon, I don't think we're looking at replacing or even radically changing how all music is created. Um, at the same time, so that's one answer. So I don't think that we're, we're looking at any sort of extreme of getting rid of human musicians anytime soon. But at the same time, kind of almost the opposite answer is if you look at recent developments in music, producing music, which used to be considered a complicated, you know, a complicated profession to be able to take a musical score and produce it. And now it's commonplace to do it on the computer using systems like Logic, GarageBand, Ableton. Right now it's normal for a high school student to, to go home and make a song. And sure, maybe an expert producer will do a better job, but the gap has been closing. And that's a fact. And I think whether I do it or somebody else does it, composition is likely to see a similar trajectory that gradually computers will get more and more involved in the, in the composition process. Um, now, I like to look at it as expanding access, not taking away anything, making it so that people like me who really want to compose songs, like really, with a very, very deep desire, suddenly something makes it easier for them. Will I, using Alicia, be able to become the world's best composer? Well, it's the same question as with people who use GarageBand at home. It's the people who need help, they get the help. And that, that's sort of my hope, that it just increases access, makes it easier. I do think it's going to gradually become more popular in one way or another to get assistance for the computer. I hope this answers your first questions. Please let me know if it doesn't. Um, copyright, I've actually looked into it <laughs> very recently. Uh, and there's a lot of precedent with Google and other companies uh, using data to create, uh, to create various, various systems, uh, and that's within... Basically, it can be done to have the copyright given to the user. So same way as if you use GarageBand or Ableton to create, produce a song, the song is then yours. Same thing with Alicia. You make the song, the song is yours. Uh, now, I'm sure that I lost at least one question in there, so let me just put on my headphones and, and ask which part I've... Add to what Rafael added. So uh, again, in the same way that um, sorry, can't do this at the same time. Um, <laughs> uh, at the same way that GarageBand helps mostly, it's focused on the young generation, the way that young people make music. Same thing with Alicia. That's I think the people who are going to find it most exciting and you know a way for young people to to engage in composition. Okay. Uh, 
Just a moment. Uh, I think I need a little bit more clarification. Yeah, that, that's actually exactly. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly how, we, how I view it. Something that makes it very easy for everybody to create music. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, you said uh, you use a, val a corpus, a val uh, the uniform music style. And I want to know which was the criteria for make this corpus, um, for, tra for th this training corpus. Mm -hmm. And um, second question, talking about comput computational po pro power, um, does Alicia requires a lot of resources? So where does she live, uh, you know, in one computer, in, in a server, in the cloud? Uh, where? These are great questions, uh, clearly questions by a computer scientist, engineer, great, great questions. Um, you can tell by the questions. <laughs> so, uh, um, so originally we thought that in order to have Alicia create something in a certain genre, you have to have a corpus that's just in that genre. So originally we trained it on just pop music and we were starting to create a separate corpus for, uh, what was it? Um, uh, rock and uh, classical, we thought everything had to be separated. And then uh, we managed to create uh, this enormous corpus of mixed genre things, and that works really well. Mixed genre, I think the reason is, and that's kind of interesting from a music theory perspective, melodies, just the vocal line without the chords, without everything else, are not as sensitive to the genre as I thought. They are, there is a relationship, it's not that you can have any melody for any genre, but it's not as tightly linked as I thought it would be. And so yeah, right now it's a very, very mixed bag of different genres. Question number two, it lives on the cloud. Yeah, and we're setting it up right now, parallelizing it, making it more efficient. It used to take minutes, right now it takes a few seconds. We're very proud. <laughs> oh, okay, another one. English or Spanish? English, if you Eng want. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, uh, like, we're seeing Alisa right now on the screen. Uh, but I, I just see like an input text mm -hmm. box. Yeah. What if I know what uh, key or time signature I want to use? So that's actually, um, the system itself, the backend supports that, uh, but it's something that we're putting into the user interface. So it's solved, it's really solved. It's just not, not in the user interface well yet. I was gonna ask if it's kind of like what the Alisa system is all about, like if it gives you a lot of other uh, choices for you to make. I think um, it's, it's a delicate balance. You know, when you're designing the system, there are parameters that a human can control. For example, for we have a parameter that can control how wild Alicia gets. So uh, between conservative choices to really wild, completely random choices. So there's a parameter you could control for that. Um, you could control the time and key signature. So th there are a few parameters you can control. We're right now kind of working on the user interface, just entering that part of the space. And what we are gonna have is, you know, a settings button where you can express a little bit more. But it's also important for me to kind of hit the right balance. That it's not, that suddenly the user doesn't have to pull a whole bunch of levers and make a whole bunch of choices that some users won't know how to do. So it's a balance, yeah. But you're right, it, having a few of those features is helpful. So we, it's done, it just needs to be integrated with the user interface, <laughs> yeah. Uh, another question would be how many choices do you get from from just oh, one line? So uh, it really it's infinite in principle. In practice, we currently generate 10 if you don't like any of the 10, click generate again, you get 10 more, click generate again. It never gets tired. <laughs> that it's advantage over a human collaborator. I wake at two o'clock in the morning, giving you infinitely many choices. <laughs> Hello, uh, I have a question. Uh, how do you make that the computer doesn't seem like a kind of squirt? Uh, the music doesn't hear a kind of squirt, that you could detect some patterns. And could you input other rhymes, like uh, to be the computer a little bit more creative? So the first part, I think I understood well. The second one, so, um, okay, sorry. The first part again. Uh, yeah, that if it, how, how could you make uh, that how the, how the not square? How, how come the music is not boring, right? Yeah. Okay, that is an excellent question. And actually, right now that we are in the development phase, focusing on the user interface, it's easy to forget for us and people who are playing with the system, the inordinate amount of work we put in to make these melodies good. 
I mean, really, that's a scientific contribution here. Um, it took, we spent two years on this. And it was never too repetitive, I guess, because, because of the random process that we're using and because it's trained on real data, right? Because it's trained on real songs. But fine tuning the model so that the melodies are good, like the first, I don't know why I'm admitting this, but the first few months of Alicia, when I would show it to a musician, in one second they would have a whole bunch of criticisms. Maya, why do the notes keep going up and down? Nobody can sing this. This doesn't make sense for, they, it was just so easy to criticize because I'm not a composer, right? So I couldn't see everything. Even though I'm a singer, that wasn't enough for me to see really obvious flaws. And we kept improving the model, working very, very hard on increasing the corpus, fine-tuning the model, um, it, what is it, choosing good, uh, good features, so that the, until we felt like, okay, this is coming up with beautiful melodies, and when a person that even tend to connect well together, so that, that's a real achievement of this research. Yeah, the, coming up with this that gives random melodies is, is an engineering effort. It's not, it's not research. So, so thank you for this great question. Second question that you had. Let me try to. If you could put another input of music to make the computer a little bit more creative. Another input, like to put in some. Like a new kind of music or some rhythms. That oh, okay. If you train it on, uh, what y it's going to give you what you train it on. You might have to tune the model a little bit. Let's say I suddenly, let's say if you're a composer and I feed it only, let's say, your music. It's actually kind of amazing. It, it, it can learn from a small set as well. I might have to change the parameters with it just until it does a good job. But yeah, absolutely. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that's tying Alicia to creating traditional style music. Thanks. Yeah. Well, um, Maja, thank you very much and congratulations for your beautiful voice and, and the <laughs> way you use it. And also to Rafael, uh, congratulations for that. Um, uh, probably two a bit of uh, wild questions that, that I think mm -hmm. are interesting. One is, um, what other meaningful developments in this field are, uh, do you think are use would be useful to um, talk about in relation to what you're doing? I'm, I'm talking about the way in which uh, big data is being used, for instance, in the case of uh, Apple Music or many other uh, platforms that uh, you know, distribute music. Uh, I think they're definitely trying to map uh, what sort of usage of the, the music is being you know, developed around, uh, which by itself I think is pretty interesting. Um, mostly if you consider the fact that now it's possible to measure up uh, certain uh, data from the body with this sort of um, Biofeedback. Yeah, yeah, biofeedback. Um, precisely in the moment where, where we're when we are listening to music. So you could have very interesting sort of parameters to, to analyze and to compare. That's that, that would be uh, the first um, part of the question. Um, probably I should you know, speak about the other part later on. Um, okay, great. Um, so there's so many, so many things we could talk about. Oh my god. Uh, so I'll get to buy feedback in a second. Um, the deep learning movement has been so powerful that some people, that it's ironically being thought of as synonymous with artificial intelligence. That's how influential it's been. Now, of course, it's not the same as artificial intelligence, but that being said, it has, it's moved many, many fields forwards very significantly. I was actually recently on a panel about artificial intelligence, and the three other people on my panel talked exclusively about deep learning. Um, so this is, in a way, not, not, not entirely part of this wave because there's a lot of ideas from computational creativity that we brought in focused on evaluation and kind of a whole computational creativity framework. But in a way, in part, it's also part of that wave because it is, it is big data and the more data we have, the stronger we can make the models. And it's already trained on hundreds of thousands of songs right now. Um, so that's, we could not have necessarily done this so well um, if, you know, a couple of decades ago or even a decade ago. Uh, so it's definitely part of it. Uh, in parallel, there have been some beautiful developments in autonomous music generation without lyrics. So what makes this essentially unique is the proper integration with lyrics. Now, there are other people who are doing music, completely autonomous music, so no human interaction, but also no lyrics. And deep, deep learning has really, really helped starting to create an overall coherency to the music. You know how we talked about lyrics and it being very difficult to create coherency a whole story with the lyrics, same thing with music. 
If you tell the computer to create a whole piece of music, it's going to create nice little pieces, but not necessarily a coherent thing. So, but deep learning is starting to crack that. It's starting, it's starting to, be, to work in that direction. Now, biofeedback is actually an interest of mine. It's an area that I'm getting into. And one thing that we're looking at doing is using the muse that picks up your brain, brain signals uh, to, come up, to compose music for you that t tends to have a positive effect on your brain, brain waves. Yeah, so that's extremely exciting. And y y there is even a, re a talk I, I heard recently about using biofeedback devices to help people connect with each other better. It's such an exciting, such an exciting new field. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, a little bit different from this talk, but very interesting too. Yeah. Well, but that's yeah. pretty much it. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah. thank you. Yeah. More questions? Oh, thank you very much. English? Um, okay. Can we do the opposite uh, thing? I said uh, to know uh, from where music is the influence of uh, the composition. For example, to know if music is copy, is a copy of another one, and to to be able with your system to be uh, to find from where mu from what music is was uh, created one new music or reverse engineer. Um, <laughs> That's a fascinating question. I haven't. Uh, that, that's um, definitely not something that Alicia does right now. But but uh, but I understand you're basically asking, can we do something like this? Um, I think in principle it's possible. And I think what's going to happen is that we're going to find influences that we weren't expecting, because while there's a lot of options for melodies, there are also reuses of, sh especially the type of output that Alicia gives, small melodic phrases that might be similar across many, many different songs. So I think we, we would have to capture a lot of information about the music, uh, about the way it's produced, about the lyrics, about the melodies, how they're coming together, and then try to find close matches in, uh, in a database. Uh, that would be, uh, I, think, I think it's definitely possible to make progress, um, but a big undertaking. <laughs> yeah, great question. Do I need headphones? Okay, let me try in English. I, I would like to know how the system recognize the feeling or expression in the words to make the mel a, a melody. Because when we write songs, we use sad chords or minor chords uh, to complement the, the sad part of the lyrics. And the other question is, what could happen or what the system could do with a tonal language? Because w w from my experience, I find very difficult to make a song uh, using a tonal language uh, without changing the meaning of the words. Because th the language has a melody and it is very difficult to find the chords Okay, great. Two excellent questions. Uh, by the time I hear the second one, I, I stop. I forgot the first one. Uh, sorry, just quick, quick reminder. Yeah, uh, how the system recognizes the feeling oh, or right, expression feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of the word. Yeah. So that you're actually hitting here on a very deep topic, um, not deep learning deep, <laughs> just deep. Um, we like to think that a lot of stuff we do related to creativity is very closely connected to feelings. And it is, because everything that humans do is related to feelings. Okay, humans that are not in touch with their feelings can't make the most basic decisions. Like there, were, there was research like this. It, it's really amazing. So we need our feelings for everything. Computers don't. And it's upsetting. There is something very uncomfortable about a computer doing something without feelings that we feel deserves to be done with feelings. Now, how do they do that? In this case, usually it's because either a human taught them rules that secretly embed the feelings in there or how the human kind of it's in there somewhere in the human rules or in this case the music that they train from embeds some feelings indirectly so the computer learns through that that's kind of the broad answer but more specifically you're talking about chords and to be honest Alicia doesn't do chords now but it could a, a computer can do chords and we plan to add chords to it and I think that's where a lot of the feeling really comes from not entirely, but a lot of it, and that's something we're going to add. And again, it's just going to happen by, essentially, the computer looks at a whole bunch of examples and sees, okay, in a way similar to how humans do it, 
we tend to hear minor chords with sad things, tend to hear major chords with happy things, and a lot more detail. The computer can do this kind of learning uh, without explicitly being aware of emotions or, of course, experiencing emotions, as far as we know. <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, that's for the first part. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, you, you know, hu emo emotions used to not be considered an important part of creativity until the first machines came about and were just way too good at being exact and accurate. And that's when creativity became really closely connected with emotions because, in my opinion, humans wanted to maintain exclusive right to creativity. <laughs> um, your second question was also good. Can you give me a quick reminder? Tonal language, yeah. So it's, I, I guess the answer is the same. All of that because um, it learns from the relationship between the words and the music. So it's extreme. You can imagine that if you saw the same word enough, you start noticing the kind of tones that go with it. So yeah, that's very, very important for Alicia because we want it to be singable. So it can't just be a nice piece of music that doesn't fit well with the, with the music of the language. Yeah, so that's really at the heart of Alicia. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, last question because we, we have another meeting no, at one with some of you and we need to give some break to But I'm speech. having so much fun. But <laughs> just the last question. Who? I oh, no. Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Well, it was uh, similar to other questions, but I have a, uh, another one. Uh, for me, music, it uh, builds on parameters, like first, fourth, fifth, and then fifth, f uh, fourth, first, or something like that. Not especially, you know, traditional music, like the one that we are hearing. So I don't understand really well how that uh, composition fits in that, uh, in that construction of uh, yeah. music. It, it seems like a little random to me. So uh, I don't understand really how yeah, you put the harmony later, but how? <laughs> okay, no, that's right, that's right. So it's, this doesn't, um, it sounds like you're a composer. Uh -huh. so you, you no, can tell. I'm not a composer. So but you can compose, definitely. <laughs> oh, obviously, that, that's clear. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, the difference between, um, you see, um, there's so, so many ways to respond to that. I mean, the, the quick answer is that, you know, it learns, that's another thing that it picks up from its data, right? And our success in picking it up uh, based on the feature, sorry, I lost the vision. Okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's how good it is at doing it depends on you perhaps selecting the right features for the model to make sure that the model can pay attention to this. So there are ways to sort of implicitly tell a machine learning system what to pay attention to without becoming a very direct teacher. Okay. Uh, so any, any failure on our part in, in doing that is a failure in, in, in specifications. Um, but in general, I mean, as far as how it fits into your, into your process, now I'm, I'm well aware that this, is not, this does not uh, correspond well to everybody's process. One obvious um, inversion is actually the one that you pointed out. Do the chords first and then come up with the melody, and that's a very reasonable way. Um, both of these approaches, melody first, then, then chords, or chords and melody, they're both very common, and people have very strong feelings about which one is better, but ultimately both are ultimately legitimate and people choose which one they like. Now we would like to be able to accommodate what you're saying and as far as the high level concept of the research is very similar. You just, instead of learning notes, you learn the chords. And so there's nothing that prevents us from going the other way around. The only challenge there uh, from a computational perspective is that chord structure has to be very consistent throughout the whole piece so there's a little bit of extra work that will go into the sort of global structure. Um, yeah, but, but I agree, and it's especially for professional composers who already know how to do this, I don't expect Alicia to help everybody. Uh, because this is kind of, uh, the research in a way explores what can computers do to be creative, but on the kind of practical side it explores how we can help people compose. And some people, especially among professional composers or people who are very good at it, some will find it useful and some prefer their own process. Uh, but where I, where I think it will make a big difference is increasing access to composition. Uh, to lyrical comp composition. Great pointed question. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> so before Maya destroys all the flags in, on, on the stage, we uh, thank you very much. Please, uh, un aplauso. Para
uh, want to give you this uh, recognition for your wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, in order that you don't forget us. Muchas gracias. Me encanta ver que el auditorio está lleno. Eso es bien importante, ¿no? Traemos gente de este estilo y yo creo que hay que aprovecharla. Siempre digo que hay que explotar que, eh, a, a las personas que vienen en el buen sentido de la palabra. Qué bueno que están aquí y recuerden que mañana, eh, también sé que hay gente de la UNAM, qué bueno que vinieron, aunque está bien lejos, pero este, me alegra mucho que estén aquí. Y recuerden que mañana tenemos el taller a las 10 aquí en la… Uh, este, Usos múltiples, ¿sí? aquí en usos múltiples. Que es importante que se registren porque si no, no cabemos todos. Eh, muchas gracias y bueno, pues nos vemos mañana. Thank you very much, Maya. Thank you so much.